Hey, once again, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Timber Creek on this beautiful fall day. How many of you guys are digging the sunshine today? Come on, baby. Hey, listen, if you are new with us today, we're so grateful to have you joining us. We'd love to just take a moment to get to know you. If, if when we're done today, you just swing by Next Steps. Love to chat with you a little bit. Uh, for those of you who are uh, joining us online because you are out checking out the amazing color on the trees right now, we're grateful that you guys are uh, joining us online. But for those of you who are in person, come on. I'm thankful that you guys are with us today. Uh, you, got, you got the rest of this week to be able to check out the trees, and I encourage you to do so. But uh, my name's Patrick. I'm the lead pastor here at Timber Creek, and I am incredibly gr- glad that you guys joined us today because we're kicking off our big fall teaching series on the book of Galatians. One more time, would you wave those books with me? That's amazing. Hey, um, I want to say, you guys can use those. Yeah, some of you are already using them, using them as fans. So um, I want to say this. If you have never studied through a book of the Bible before, I'm really excited to get to do that with you over the course of the next couple of weeks here. And Galatians is kind of a kingpin in the New Testament because in the book of Galatians, you find the bedrock of our faith. I mean, it is absolutely amazing. It takes only about 15 minutes to read through the entire thing, but it is jam-packed with solid gold. And so I'm excited we get to jump into that today. Before we get started, I do want to say this. Research has shown that the number one thing that a church can do to help people experience the fullness of what God has for them, the number one thing is to get them into the Word of God themselves. That's why every fall we do a a teaching series. You guys, if you've been with us for a while, you know we do all kinds of teaching series, but every fall we just lock in on the book of the Bible and we just walk through it together. Um, It's also why uh, Pastor Josh mentioned this, uh, but it's also why we had some generous families in the church that just said we want to get the Word of God into the hands of of everybody who's here. That's how much we believe in the Word of God. That's how much we believe in the power in the Word of God to change your life. A friend of mine sent me a quote this week that said, any place the Bible is applied as the powerful Word of God, the Holy Spirit is at work and lasting change follows. So I'm excited to be able to do that. I want to give you a heads up though. Galatians is probably the most forward and feisty of all of the Apostle Paul's writings, right? I mean, he is blunt, he is confrontive, and some of you are like, that is my personality perfectly, right? How many of you guys, you'd say, that's you, you're ready to go through this book here. Um, Some of you guys are ready to to announce that even, right? So you're going to hear, you're going to hear kind of a sense of urgency in Paul's voice, in his writing here, there's emotion in his words. And it's actually, it's interesting to note that this is the book that Martin Luther read that got him fired up and led to him nailing the 95 theses to the door of the church in Germany. It's, it's the book that he read that got him fired up that led to the Reformation. And so you got to know this, that, that you're going to see that the topic in this book of Galatians has a tendency to get people fired up. So as we get ready to step into it today, what I want to do is I want to give you some really good background today so that you understand what we're about to read together. The first few verses of the book actually help us with that. And so let's look at it together. This is Galatians chapter one, and it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from man nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. To the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you grew up in church, you may have a a good awareness or understanding of who the Apostle Paul was. But for those of you who didn't, Paul was a Jewish leader who took his religion very seriously. So seriously, in fact, that when Christianity began to break out, Paul saw it as his job to travel around from town to town and just snuff it out. That was his, his mission here. However, on one of those missions, he had an encounter with Jesus. And so Paul, who was a Jew, became a Jesus follower. He was a law man who became a faith man. He went from being a church persecutor to a church planter. How many of you guys know that when you encounter Jesus, it changes your life? 
Paul's life was changed. In fact, what he did is he traveled through what was the Eastern Roman Empire, and he planted at least 14 churches that we know of, and he was specifically trying to reach a large group of people who were called uh, Gentiles. Now, this was just a kind of a very broad term that was used to describe anybody who was not a Jew. So there was the Jewish nation, and then there were the Gentiles. It was everybody else. And so after planting these churches that Paul did, and then moving on, Paul would oftentimes, he'd write a letter back to the churches in order to continue to teach them, in order to continue to, to guide them. And these letters that he wrote make up a significant part of what we call the New Testament today. So a handful of these churches that he planted uh, are, were in modern-day Turkey. It was a region that was known as Galatia. You can see that on the map here. Now, for those of you who remember your ancient history, uh, this was uh, an area that these were the people, the Celtic people known as the Gauls. So this was Galatia, Galatia. He planted some churches in Galatia here. You read all about that in Acts chapters 13 and 14. Not long after he planted those churches and left, he wrote a letter back to all the churches in Galatia. And that letter is what we now call the book of Galatians. And so the the book that we're studying is actually a letter that Paul wrote back to these churches in this region. Are you guys all with me? Right now. Paul had a typical rhythm in his writing. Uh, I'm going to go back to the verses that we had up here just earlier. Um, Paul would introduce himself first. Then he would identify who he's writing to, to the churches in Galatia. And then he would give a salutation like this, like a grace and peace to you from God our Father, right? Um, this is what this is kind of the, the, the rhythm that we see in his writing here in Galatians. And then... After this salutation, Paul would typically take some time to just love on the people that he's writing to. He would offer up thanksgiving and praise uh, before he got into his teachings. He would take some time to just kind of love on them. For example, this is the first line after his greeting, his salutation to the Romans in his letter to Rome. He said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Then when we get to the the, uh, letter to the Corinthians, the line right after his salutation, he says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. And then in Colossians, he said this, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. You got the theme here? Thessalonians, one more here. He said, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. So this is the typical rhythm. His his greeting was followed by thanksgiving. But this is how Paul opens Galatians. What the heck, bro? (laughs) Have you you guys ever just jumped in with both feet on something that needed to be addressed? You guys ever done that before? This is Paul. Listen, he's got a specific reason for writing, and he plans to get to it right away. Here's why. Let me give you some background on this. After starting all of these churches in Galatia, after teaching them about the life of Jesus, after teaching them about what his death and resurrection meant for us, after teaching him that our relationship with God is no longer based on our performance, it's no longer based on our perfection, but it's based on his grace, after teaching them what it means to receive salvation through faith in Jesus, after teaching all of these things and then leaving for his, his next journey, there was a group of people who came into the church right after Paul and started teaching something different. Now, has that ever happened to you before? Have you ever gave instruction and then somebody followed you and, and like gave opposite instruction before? Um, back during, during COVID, I had a friend who, who bought a smoker. Uh, he thought it was a good idea. You're going to be at home a lot. Let me learn how to do some, some smoking, right? So he called me one day and he's like, um, hey, I want to I smoke a brisket. How do I do that? Now, as much as I act like I'm a pro, you know I'm, I'm not that great when it comes to smoking. But I, I, of course, I put on a front. And so I'm like, hey, listen, here's how you do it. I gave him some instructions. And I said, the key is low and slow. How many of you guys in the room, you do some smoking meat and stuff? Low and slow. That's the key phrase, right? Low and slow. So the next day I, I texted him. I said, how did it turn out? And he said, well... 
I kind of ran short on time, and so my neighbor said, just turn up the heat. He said, so instead of going low and slow, I kind of went high and fast, and it turned out uh, tough, it turned out gross, you know, and I'm like, listen, like, don't listen to that guy. Just don't, don't listen, don't listen to that guy anymore. Listen, here's what happened, okay? After Paul left the churches in Galatia, uh, there were a group of people called Judaizers that came in. And just very simply, Judaizers were people who believed in Jesus as the Messiah, but they still followed and promoted Judaism, which was essentially a religion focused on following all the laws of the Old Testament. And so background on this, before Jesus came, God's people lived by a completely different set of rules. And it was all they had ever known. It was all they'd ever known. There was a set of laws that God had given Moses which had to be obeyed in order for there to be a relationship. That These laws had to be obeyed. You might be familiar with the top 10 of those laws. It's what we call the, the Ten Commandments today. But there were actually 613 laws total that had to be obeyed perfectly. These laws had to be obeyed perfectly in order to be in right standing with God. So they memorized them. They practiced them. They were consumed with them. It was their life. And you, you see this as you read through the Old Testament, as you read through the ancient Hebrew scriptures, you see this. It was a law-based religion. These 613 laws here, they showed what sin was, but then they also pointed to righteousness or they pointed to a right standing with God by perfectly following these laws. If you could perfectly follow these laws, you were righteous. The problem was, as you could guess, nobody could do it, right? Nobody could perfectly follow the law. And that's why it was so significant that when Jesus came, he perfectly fulfilled the law for us. And the need to follow God's law to be considered righteous came to an end. Jesus fulfilled our need to live perfectly. Now, I would have thought I would have got an amen on that somewhere in this room. Jesus fulfilled your need, your requirement to live perfectly. Man, somebody, you came today just to hear that, just to be unburdened by that. He did that because he fulfilled the law that was given to Moses. These 613 laws, it's incredible. Here's what Jesus said. He said in Matthew 5, he said, don't misunderstand why I've come. I've not come to abolish the law. I've not come to get rid of it. I have come to accomplish their purpose. And what was their purpose? The purpose of the law was righteousness. It was right standing with God. And Jesus accomplished it. For us. That's why Paul later on, he said uh, in a letter to the Romans, he said, Jesus has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. And now, now, all who believe in him are made righteous with God. So this is, this is what's happening. See, since the, the requirement to be in right standing with God, the requirement for you and I to be in right standing with God was perfection. And so God first showed what perfection was through the law, and then God showed what perfection was in Jesus, a Savior who could fulfill that requirement for us because we could not, and that way we can have a relationship with him. This is all background that's so important. Here's what Paul later wrote. He said this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. This is faith in Jesus. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Jesus changed the game. He changed the game. He changed the agreement. This is why there is a marked difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in your Bible. They're divided into the Old Covenant, the Old Agreement, and the New Covenant, the New Agreement. And if you've ever wondered what separates the two, here's what they are. In the Old Covenant, righteousness could only come through following the law. In the New Covenant, righteousness only comes through faith in Jesus. And so let's pause here for a moment, okay? You are no longer required to be under the Old Covenant.
Are you with me? I mean, I've been preaching for 20 minutes now. All of it's been coming to this point. You are no longer required to be under the old covenant. It doesn't mean that its laws are not incredibly valuable. It doesn't mean that it's not filled with life principles, but it's no longer binding. Let me, let me ask a question. How many of you guys have moved in the last 10 years? The house you live in now, that's okay. Here we go. The lease or the mortgage that you had 10 years ago, you were renting a house or you had a mortgage on a property. It was accurate and it was for that time, but you're no longer held to that agreement, are you? Because you no longer live there. Because you no longer live there. The old covenant is no longer the active covenant for the people of God because of Jesus, it's simply not where you live anymore. It was fulfilled by him, but he's moved you to a different place. You're no longer underneath that agreement. So back to the book of Galatians, okay? After Paul taught these churches that Jesus fulfilled the law and we don't live under the law anymore, these false teachers came in, these Judaizers, they came in and they began saying that people still had to follow some of the laws before they could receive salvation, I just want you to check this out, okay? They didn't deny that faith in Jesus was necessary. They insisted it was not enough. Jesus was not enough. And those were fighting words to Paul. You see why he's fired up? You see why this is, I mean, he's pretty feisty here. Those were fighting. (laughs) These false teachers, they'd come in and they were convincing these new Christians that salvation was through faith in Jesus and following the law now i'm curious i'm curious do you ever live that way in your own life feeling like you have to do something in order to be in right standing with god see if we're not careful we can fall into this trap in our own lives believing that our relationship with god is based on our faith in jesus and whatever fill in the blank Right, So these Jews, they had a hard time letting go of the law. It was all they had known, their belief that they had to do something. The law had been so close to them, so dear to them their entire lives. And so Paul is confronting them in this letter, confronting those who keep going back to the old way of doing things because Jesus brought something completely new. And so he speaks more bluntly, he speaks more boldly in this letter than any other, What the heck, bro? What the heck? Here's here's the actual words that he used, okay? So this is verse 6, right? He said, I'm astonished. Some of your translations say, I'm shocked. Some of them say, I am stunned. I'm stunned that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel. You're turning away. Paul's saying, I can't believe you're bailing so quickly on the grace that Jesus offered you. This new covenant. I can't believe that you would choose to go back into this requirement of perfection. I can't believe that you would bail on this new covenant here. So he goes on to say this. He says, evidently, evidently, some people, these, these Judaizers, evidently there's some people among you that are throwing you into confusion and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. These false teachers, Paul is saying, they're trying to deceive you. They're they're trying to mix the old covenant and the new covenant, and they don't mix. They don't don't mix together. Now, we're going to talk more about this in the next few weeks, the mixing of the old covenant and the new covenant here. But you can see why this is such a big deal to Paul, can't you? He says the idea that you need Jesus plus anything else in order to be in right standing with God, robs us of the truth of the gospel. But we do this all the time, and it kills us. It makes us anxious. It robs us of our freedom. It turns us into slaves. Anytime, whenever we look to anything other than Jesus for our acceptance before God, we've lost our grip on the gospel and we've bought into a lie and that's why paul is so 
aggressive. He's ticked. And this isn't just some obscure ancient problem that Paul had to address in his day. This is a problem that we, we face in our culture on a regular basis here. But we've got to learn that Jesus plus anything ends in bondage and destruction for us. So Paul comes out swinging. <laughs> this first few chapters especially. It, it kinda, he kind of softens a little bit, but he jumped in with both feet. This chapter, uh, these first few chapters in the letter to the Galatians here. The law simply won't cut it. Because you can't follow it. Jesus is our only hope and our only salvation. Now this is some good perspective here as we wrap up today. It's important for us to understand as we're talking about Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant here. It's important to understand that Old Covenant principles continue to direct us but its laws no longer dictate to us our relationship with God. And so there's stuff that we can still learn from the old covenant, but God's people don't live there anymore. You don't live there anymore. We live in a relationship with Jesus now. Jesus, the one who fulfilled the law, the one who fulfilled your requirement for perfection. That's the new covenant. That's the new agreement. And in this covenant, Jesus did everything. This is where Paul's going to land. What the heck, bro? <laughs> How could you turn from this truth so quickly? Why would you ever want to go back to a requirement of trying to live perfect when you know you can't? There's only one hope for us. There's only one hope for you. Jesus. He did everything everything now this is a great place for us to pick up next week we're just getting into the book of galatians paul is just getting warmed up if you think that he came out a little strong just wait until you get to the next couple of chapters here listen it takes 15 minutes to read through that book that's in your lap today i encourage you to read through it each week as we go through this series it's not too much 15 minutes, just read through it, and you'll see what I'm talking about as we get into chapters 2 and 3, when Paul is just aggressive, you can, you can hear the fieriness in his writing. As we get ready to close today, I want to say this though, okay? Maybe you have thought, I've got to believe in Jesus, and i got to have my junk together before I can be righteous with God. That's a lie. Now listen, listen. I want to get my junk together. Is there anybody with me? I want to get my junk together. But my imperfection no longer keeps me from the Father. Because of Jesus, my imperfection, and I've got a lot of imperfection in my life, my imperfection no longer keeps me from the Father. And maybe you've bought into that lie in your life. And I don't know why anyone wouldn't want to, to believe this. I don't know why everyone wouldn't want to believe this is true. Why they wouldn't want to simply follow Jesus rather than to try to come back underneath this old covenant that says, okay, if you're not going to follow Jesus, then the requirement is perfection. This is why, once sin entered the world, that God the Father said, there's no way. There's no way that my creation is going to be able to do this. I've got to find a way to save them. Are you following me? You know where I'm going, don't you? There's no way that this created humanity is going to be able to be perfect sins entered into the world now i've got to find a way to get them back to get back in a relationship with them i've got to find a way but the requirement you just got to know this the righteousness the requirement for righteousness can't change god is a righteous king he's a righteous god and so it's not that he could just say, oh, I'm just going to let it all slide. 
righteousness and perfection still was the requirement. But he knew that you couldn't do that. He knows you, can't, you still can't do it today. I can't do it today. And so the father said, I'm going to send my son. He's going to live perfectly for you. He's going to fulfill this requirement from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant, this requirement of perfection. He's going to fulfill that for you so that now you can be righteous through him. What's required now is not perfection. It's faith in the one who is perfect. It's faith in Jesus, the one who fulfilled that for you. This is why we come back to this every single week at Timber Creek. Listen, guys, there is no other way. The world's going to tell you, the world told me to try other things, but I'm telling you, there is, there's no other way except through faith in him, the one who lived it for you, the one who did it for you. And so if you're here today and you have never placed your, your faith in Jesus, you've never really asked him to take the lead in your life, I want to give you an opportunity to do that before we leave today. If you guys would take a moment right now and just bow your heads and close your eyes. This is just a moment between you and the Lord, just a private moment. I want to give you an opportunity before we leave today because following Jesus is letting his perfection replace your imperfection. It's placing your faith in him, allowing him to take the lead in your life. And if you're ready to do that today, I'm going to ask if you'd just lift your hand to the Lord just as a sign to him right now. If you're ready to do that today, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. You may have heard it a hundred times before, and it's no magic words. It's really just the decision that's happening in your heart today. So just pray these words to the Lord. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me even in my imperfection. Thank you for loving me even in my stubbornness. Thank you for loving me even in my mess. Thank you for loving me so much that you sent your son Jesus to fulfill this requirement of perfection for me. Thank you that because of that, because of what Jesus did, I can, I can be in a right relationship with you. And so Jesus, I just ask you today, would you forgive me of all my past mistakes, all my sin? Take the lead in my life from this day forward. I place you at the center of who I am and I ask you to help me follow you. My life is yours.